Contrary to that highly publicized prediction, the world did not end over the weekend, which means a number of preachers who live like rock stars will get to continue living the good life. How good? Here's Lisa Guerrero and the iSquad with a look at some who've been preaching prosperity who are living large. Fresh wind! Fresh! They are some of the most popular TV preachers in the country. We're family here! They urge the faithful followers to donate generously, and in return, the Lord will bring them prosperity. I'm not going to be going to heaven and be broke when I get there. And there's no denying some people have prospered handsomely. Wow! The now pastors themselves. The they live like rock stars with huge mansions, private jets, and fancy cars. Their lifestyles are so lavish, six of them have been investigated by the U.S. Senate. Like Paula White, who lives in multi-million dollar homes in New York City and Tampa, Florida. And Creflo Dollar, he gets around in style, flying in private jets to preach around the country. He owns this mansion in an exclusive Atlanta suburb. Mr. Dollar, how do you Not one of them would agree to an interview about their opulent lifestyle. How do you justify your million dollar mansions in your jets to all of your donors, sir? Oh, yeah. But when it comes to opulence, few religious leaders compare to Kenneth Copeland. You and I are supposed to always have. To show you his house, we rented this helicopter so you could see his 18,000 square foot mansion valued at over $6 million. He lives in this home outside Fort Worth, Texas. It has beautiful water views and comes complete with a boathouse. But that's not all. Copeland is an avid pilot, and here's his pride and joy, a $20 million Cessna Citation jet. It's the fastest private jet money can buy. He said he needed it to better serve the Lord, and proudly did a flyby for his followers after the church bought it. Shout it! But it's not just one plane. We found a fleet of planes registered to the church. And you won't catch him waiting in line at the airport because he's got his own, the Kenneth Copeland Airport, located right next to his mansion. I think Copeland is unbelievably greedy. Oli Anthony heads the Trinity Foundation, a religious watchdog group that worked closely with the Senate committee investigating Copeland and other TV preachers. Televangelism alone is at least a two and a half to three billion dollar industry untaxed, unregulated. That's right. By law, religious groups like Copeland's are exempt from federal taxes and they don't have to report how they spend their money to anyone. Amen. Copeland's church takes in tens of millions a year through donations and selling books and DVDs to his donors. She sent them a lot of money, a, a whole lot of money. When Christy Parker's mother died of cancer, she found diaries that showed her mother sent Copeland most of her life savings, hoping her faith and donations would cure her of her terminal disease. What do you think of Kenneth Copeland's lifestyle? TV doesn't do it justice. Their office furniture is probably worth more than most people's houses. It makes you sick. Oh my. Copeland refused our request for an interview, so we caught up with him at an event in North Carolina. Uh, why you're living such a lifestyle of luxury off of church donations? Ma'am, I don't think we have time for this. Thank you. Thank you why very much. won't you answer our questions? A hotel employee tried to prevent us from taping. Well, wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Come here. It's just a simple question, sir. Yes, and I'm going to give you a simple answer. Thank you. My lifestyle follows the scripture. We give, we believe, we're open. You have a fleet of private jets. Why is that necessary? You're a minister. How many private jets do you have? That is right after that, he walked away. Today I want to talk about the business of religion. One of the biggest money makers out here, y'all, is religion. Preachers are getting filthy, filthy, filthy rich off of playing on the strings of the ignorance of people. What I'd like to do for a basis of my message to you today is 
refer to a passage of scripture out of the Bible in the book of Hosea. The fourth chapter of Hosea, I want to read several verses there. In fact, I'm going to read 17 verses to you. But I'm not going to read it out the King James translation. I'm not going to read it out the King James Bible because the King James translation does not really make it as clear as the message is intended from the original languages of the Hebrew text. So if you don't mind, I'm going to read a transliteration or a what we call uh, a literal translation or a more modern rendering from what is called the message text. You can follow along in your Bible and maybe see the parallel meaning and perhaps, perhaps this will shed a little bit more light on each verse as we go through it. But verse 1 of the fourth chapter of Hosea Reading from the message, it says, Attention! Attention! All Israelites! Now, of course, if you understand the truth of the fact that there were no Israelites, let me allow, allow me to replace that phrase with, that word with this phrase, the people of God. Attention! All people of God or attention all of God's people would that include you okay hear God's message for God has an indictment on the whole population no one is faithful no one loves no one knows the first thing about God. Let me insert in this point and say, we all know a lot about religion. But we don't know as we ought to the first thing about God. Second verse. It reads by saying, all this cussing and lying and killing, theft, and loose sex, sheer anarchy, one murder after another. Third verse, and because of all this, the land itself is in trouble and is weeping. The very land itself and everything in it is grief stricken. Animals in the fields and birds on the wing, even the fish in the sea are lifeless. Fourth verse. But don't look for somebody else to blame. Stop pointing the finger. You priests are the ones who are causing this. That deep. Fifth verse. Talking about the priest now. The pastors. The religious leaders of the people. It goes on to say, you stumble around in broad daylight. And then the prophets come and take over and stumble all night long. Your mother, meaning the land, is as bad as you. Sixth verse. Now you've, we've come up to the verse we're more used to hearing. My people are ruined because of you. They don't know what's right or true. That was the message right there. My people are ruined because of you, religious leaders. They don't know what's right or true. Because you have turned your back on knowledge. I have 
turn my back on you priests. Y'all hear this? When the religious leaders are in the business of religion, they've turned their back on knowledge. They're more interested in what's popular. They're more interested in what's going to bring financial gain. Well, the text says, because you, priests, have turned your back on knowledge, I've turned my back on you. And because you refuse to recognize the revelation of God, I am no longer recognizing your children. Seventh verse. This gets deep, y'all. It says, the more priests, the more sin. They traded in their glory for shame. This is some deep stuff. Eighth verse says, they pig out on my people's sins. They can't wait for the latest in evil. Ninth verse, the result, you can't tell the people from the priests. Or the priests from the people. I'm on my way to make both pay and take the consequences of the bad lives they've lived. Tenth verse, they'll eat and be as hungry as ever, have sex, and get no satisfaction. They walked out on me, their God, for a life of rutting with whores. It's kind of raw, isn't it? I didn't make this up. Pull it up yourself on the internet or go buy this version for yourself. Go to BibleGateway.com, type in Hosea 4, and read, pull down the version that says the message, and read right what I'm reading to you for yourself. 11th verse goes on with says now it says, Wine and whiskey leave my people in a stupor. 12th verse. They ask questions of a dead tree and expect answers from a sturdy walking stick. Drunk on sex, they can't even find their way home. All because of the religious leaders. They replace their God with their genitals. This ain't too raw, is it? Okay. They worship on the tops of mountains and make a picnic out of religion. Under the oaks and elms on the hills, they stretch out and take it easy. Before you know it, your daughters are whores and the wives of your sons are sleeping around. 14th verse. But I'm not going to get your whoring daughters or the adulterous wives of your sons, it's the men who pick up the whores that I'm after. Did y'all hear this? Those who are supposed to be the warriors to stand strong and protect our people. It's the men who pick up the whores that the text says God is going to get. Good Lord have mercy. When I was pulling, printing this out, I said, Lord, maybe I shouldn't read this. <laughs> the men who worship at the holy whorehouses are stupid people ruined by whores. 15th verse, you've ruined your own life, but don't drag God's people down with you. Go to the sex shrine at Gilgal. Don't go to that sin city, Bethel. Don't go around saying, God bless you, and not mean it. Taking God's name in vain. My people have become stubborn as a mule. How 
can God lead him like a lamb to open pasture? Ephraim is addicted to idols. Let him go. 18th verse, when the beer runs out, it's sex, sex, and more sex. Bold and sordid debauchery, how they love it. The whirlwind has them in its clutches, and their sex worship leaves them finally impotent. Or powerless. The business of religion. Why did you read all that, Pastor? The only verse I'm used to hearing out of He Hosea 4 is the sixth verse. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. I had to let you know why the people got a lack of knowledge. Because those to whom God has given the assignment to equip the people are so busy wasting their time with stuff that really doesn't matter that the people are suffering because of it. My challenge today is to not just you sitting here, but especially those religionists who will listen to these tapes and hear this on the radio in the privacy of your den or watch this on television in the privacy of your den. I challenge you today by asking, do you really believe in what you say you believe in? I have to ask this question, y'all, because I'm convinced that if the person that you teach about, Jesus, if he was to come back like you say he is, he would turn his nose up at you. For the unholy behavior that you engage in. I wonder why some preachers preach Jesus. I really do. I tell you, it's big business. They want to hustle. Stand up. Look good. Say a few scriptures. Lay some emotions on the people. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You know, and, they, and if they feel like you ain't really listening, all they do is like, ah, mm. <laughs> that's all they got to do. And they, ah, you know. Listen, friend, as I hasten to a close, if you will just reach in and receive it, God's got it all stirred up for a reason. God says, get rid of my God, the last idol. Good God Almighty, I had mine. So I came down this morning. You see, there's a thing with me. Me not afraid of altar.
something about it. Yeah. Yeah. Pastor Ed, get a pledge slip to every one of those folks up there. I know you can shout. Now let's see if you can pledge. <laughs> doing? Get a vision of where we're going that we'll never, if we don't get a vision of it, we'll never get there. Touch your name to get a vision. Without a vision, people have, now, please, because this, I, I honestly, I got, I'm talking a whole lot. I got one thing to say. So what I need, what I... <laughs> manifest. <laughs> Every day today. Somebody ought to shout. Signs, wonders, and miracles. Tell somebody that's just the first fruit. That's just the first fruit. That's just the first fruit. I see everybody bringing that to the altar. I see everybody moving like that. Touch your neighbor and say that might be her day today, but my day coming. My day coming. My day coming. My day coming. Quick, fast, in a hurry. Quick, fast, in a hurry. If Slam, play with your emotions. <laughs> then get your money. Jump in their Lexus. Ride off into the sunset. Some preach Jesus, believe it or not, out of jealousy. Some preach out of competition. They want to be sure that their church is just as big as somebody else's. Then there are those who preach this program that was given to us by our oppressor. Out of a sincere love and commitment to it. They were raised with it. It's all they know. And they're sincere in it. And they feel that everybody ought to be proselytized into what they're saying. But I have to let you know today, I got I gotta let you know. Don't nobody else tell you, I gotta let you know. You're ignorant, brother. Now don't 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 get wrong. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you're stupid. I said you're ignorant. Anytime you want to stand up and proclaim to your own people what those who have oppressed us talk to us in the first place, you're ignorant, man. That's all I mean. Therefore, because we are proclaiming, and when I say we, I'm talking about my brothers and who stand in the position I'm standing in right now. Because we spend our time proclaiming to our people that which is really lifeless and powerless. 
simply an instrument to continue our enslavement, the black church has to end up becoming a place of entertainment. The black church has to end up becoming a place of emotional phenomena. Have you ever noticed? In the black church, the, the, the devices that are used to play on the strings of human emotions, and that device is implemented until you fall out. Once you pass out, they can take their seat. Once you fall in the floor, they can take their seat. I remember when I was growing up, we used to go through this thing called tarrying. For those of you who might know what I'm talking about, we had to get on our knees at, at the altar. And they told us, call on him. <laughs> Brother, you know what I'm talking about, huh? Call on him. Out of sincerity, I called on him. I called on him like I was going to die any minute. And I didn't want to die in that condition. And I called on him, Jesus, 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 Jesus. I would say it so fast that I couldn't swallow. My saliva would beat in my mouth with the air between my teeth. And then, of course, it would come out like foam. Y'all you know, can't swallow because I'm saying Jesus too fast to swallow. And when I start, I start drooling, they say, oh, God is purging him now. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and all sincerity, I call on him. One sister over here said, call on him, call on him. I'm calling, I want to say, I'm calling while I can. <laughs> Other sister over here say, hold on, brother. Sister behind me say, give up, brother. I wanted to stop and say, would y'all make up your mind? Somebody please. Yeah, I think y'all can relate to what I'm saying. I found out that they were waiting for me to have a response. You see, my emotional response was what they were looking for. You can't really see when God steps into someone's heart. So how else are they going to know if I got this thing that they're trying to get me to get? So this lady next to me fell out on the floor. And they stopped praying for her. So I studied Italian in high school and I knew how to say the house is beautiful in Italian. The Casa de Morte. So I laid out on the floor. The Casa de Morte. They said, he got it, he got it. And they left me alone. Some deep stuff, man. Mm, 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 mm. So you see, I found out that in our religious environment, it's not about getting the truth. It's not about really understanding the word of God. It's about how do you feel since you come out the wilderness. I'm sorry to have to be the one to say this, but it's my assignment to say it. Most of our leaders are blind to the real purpose and mission of the Mashiach. What did you just say, Pastor Ray? I used the Hebrew word Mashiach, which in English is Messiah. Most of our religious leaders are blind to the real assignment of a Christos. 
which transliterates into English to be a Christ. Notice I did not say the Christ, I said a Christ. Most of our leaders wouldn't recognize a Christ if he walked up and smacked him in the face. You know why? Because they're so bent on their religious business. Well, brother, what is a Mashiach? What is a Christos? In the Hebrew, Mashiach simply means one who is anointed for God's work. In the Greek, Christos means one who is anointed for God's work. And let me tell y'all something. We've had a whole lot of Mashiachs. We've had a whole lot of Christian come along to try to set our people free. And who is the one who attacks them? Our own people. Our own people. Folk don't like it when I say Marcus Garvey was a Christ. Folk don't like it when I say Medgar Evers was a Christ. Folk don't like it when I say Frederick Douglass was a Christ. Folk don't like it when I say Malcolm X was a Christ. Folk don't like it when I say the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was a Christ. I don't give a damn whether you like it or not. I gotta let you know a Christ is God's anointing. And the scripture stands, don't mess with my anointing. Don't mess with my anointing. No matter what you think about him or her, if God anoints somebody for service, you better respect that. Woo, buddy. If the leaders of the followers are blind, what are the followers going to do? Uh, 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 uh. If the preachers preach a message that they don't really believe in, I know they don't. I don't care what they say, I know they don't really believe in it. They can't believe in it. How are they going to lead you into God's truth? How is a pastor who's a faggot? I'm sorry. I told you. Yeah, I, I feel a part, the brother just said, a part of the restraints have been removed, y'all. You see, I used to, I, I was trying to take it easy as much as possible because every week, every week in New Jersey, somebody was going to my mother saying, your son done lost his mind. Your son, he, he, he you know, she, she's in the ground now. Ain't nobody for them to run to now. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm going to really tell it like it is. Oh, yeah. I don't have to worry about her dealing with the emotional stress of folk talking about my son. You follow what I'm saying? How are you going to say you believe in Jesus and you are drunk? Huh? Huh? say you believe in Jesus and you practice homosexuality your choir director is more feminine than the women in your church and you won't sit them down I need to be looking in the camera and you won't sit them down because you don't want to lose any members and you want to know why churches are in the condition that they're in how are you going to say you believe in Christ reverend Evangelists, when you're trying to see how many dresses you can get up underneath, it don't it ain't gonna work. We're at that time now where God is saying, as I read to you, God is saying, I'm not going after the people preachers. I'm coming after you because you made the people the way they are. The story that I'm about to tell you about is shocking. Many Americans tonight, many church-going Americans. This is a story about a preacher with a following of 25,000 people. He drives a Bentley, he flies around, travels all over the world in private planes. Uh, he's appeared on this network and others, speaking out against homosexuality. Guess what? Tonight, this so-called man of God is being sued by two young men. They say that he coerced them into sexual relationships. He allegedly bought them gifts, cars, he housed them, uh, jewelry, uh, flew them around the world, all of that, and more, in exchange for sex. 
We're talking about Bishop Eddie Long, one of America's most popular Christian preachers. He's got his own television show. He's a best-selling author. His church is based right here in Georgia from where we're broadcasting. The family of Martin Luther King Jr. chose him to officiate the funeral for Coretta Scott King, where he spoke before a crowd of the nation's VIPs, including four as you hear this. I want you to listen to what the bishop told us here on CNN when we asked him about this last year. Play it, D. We've had members of our congregation, et cetera, who are of gay lifestyle, et cetera, and that's, that's nothing that uh, we can deny. Uh, a lot of times we never addressed it. We act like it wasn't Irish there. government inquiry has found that four archbishops and other senior Catholic officials conspired to cover up decades of child abuse by priests. The commission, which investigated allegations of abuse going back to the mid-1970s, reveals that one priest admitted to sexually abusing more than a hundred children. Our Ireland correspondent Mark Simpson reports. It's being described in Ireland as the ultimate abuse of trust. Not only did dozens of Irish priests attack children in their parish, the Catholic Church covered it up. Today's report concludes that the reputation of the church was put above the welfare of the children. As Archbishop of Dublin and as Dermot Martin, a person, I offer to each and every survivor my apology, my sorrow and my shame for what happened. The Commission criticised four archbishops, John Charles McQuaid, Dermot Ryan, Kevin McNamara and Cardinal Desmond Connell. It said they didn't report to police their knowledge of abuse throughout the 1960s, 1970s and the 1980s. The investigation found that at least 46 priests abused more than 300 children. The Commission spent three years poring over 60,000 previously secret Dublin church files and found five and a half thousand files that retired Cardinal Desmond Connell had tried to keep locked in his private vault. In a statement tonight, the Cardinal apologized. There is new information and reports this morning about the role of Pope Benedict when he was a Vatican Cardinal investigating the allegations of sex abuse. This case involves the leader of a prominent and well-financed Catholic order with a big presence in the U.S. Despite allegations he abused dozens of boys, the founder of the Legionaries of Christ, Father Marciel Maciel, was a favorite of Pope John Paul II and other Vatican officials. Father Maciel was a revered figure in the Vatican. And he was also known as a man who spread around generous gifts and cash to top people in the Vatican. I think Father Maciel used money the way some politicians do in spreading it liberally to buy support. Uh, both for himself and his religious order. And when these men and other former Legion members brought allegations to the Vatican that they had been abused as boys by Father Maciel, nothing happened for six full years. Absolutely nothing. Not a word. The Vatican official in charge of the investigation was then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, now Pope Benedict. I wanted to ask you a question about uh, Father Maciel. Uh, no, I, can you talk moment, about? I'm not so he became informed. upset when I tried to ask him about the delay in the Maciel case in 2002, slapping my hands. There's a question whether you uh, cover. No, no, a moment. No, there's but, a question whether you come to me when Excuse the me. moment is given. Not, not, not yet. In a new report this week, investigative journalist Jason Berry says Ratzinger was pressured to halt the case of Maciel by the Vatican Secretary of State, Cardinal Angelo Sedano. Now, the other hip, 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 hypocritical aspect of that is our churches, Kira, are filled with same gender loving people. From the, from the music department to the pulpits, black music, church music, where would it be without our same gender loving or gay musicians and singers? Not all of them are. But many of them have come to you and said, I'm gay, but I can't come oh, out. Oh, yes. Oh, and we're yeah. talking very powerful people yes, in the gospel industry. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. With tears in their eyes, they were afraid. There are people who come to me and say, I embrace your gospel of inclusion, Bishop, but I can't. It's not a theological issue with me. It's a business decision. I'll lose my flock. I'll use my money. I'll lose my parsons. I'll lose myself. I can't 
love everybody. I can't even love me, he would say. And I want, I want to say to that group, and this is a wake-up call. Until the church, the church, black or otherwise, confronts, not combats, confronts this issue of human sexuality and homosexuality, which is not going away. Homosexuals and homosexuality is not going on away. If every gay person in our church is left, or those who have an orientation or a preference or an inclination or fantasy, if everyone left, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have a church. <laughs> Just to see, that's interesting. Yeah, there are gay doctors, police officers, attorneys, priests. Look at the whole Catholic church. All this idea of celibacy, it's not even natural. Um, but it's, it's out. It's like the Christian church is having to confront Bishop issues. Eddie Long is just the tip of the iceberg. I think the universe is not judging but correcting itself. And we're having to confront these issues. I love Bishop Long. I love anybody out there hurting. And I'll be here for them. And I love your tenderness in dealing with it. It's a delicate subject. I'm trying to be as discreet and tactful as I can. But it's an issue that's not going to go away. We've got to deal with it. It's here for our help. Well. I, I, I respect very much what you preach, so I look forward to talking to you more about this. My Bishop, pleasure. thank you so much. Thank you, Kira. All right. Thank you so much. Quick break. More from the CNN Newsroom. Straight ahead. Finding out convicted sex offender Daryl Gilliard, a man who spent three years in prison for sex crimes against minors, is the church's new preacher. We believe that that decision to allow him to come here and preach is the worst decision this church could have made. And at times Monday, things got heated as Gilliard's supporters sauntered up. If I raped your daughter, you wouldn't allow me to be the pastor of her, brother. We did some checking. As a registered sex offender, by law, Gilliard cannot live in certain places. He can't work in schools or daycares. But Action News also found out there's nothing that governs whether or not a registered sex offender can lead a church. We've been programmed to preach and practice a religion that has compromised, diluted, watered down, blended a message that leaves our people in their sin and comfortable about it. Something's wrong. Look at the person that you said, something's wrong with that. Mm -mm. Switching all over the place, talking about in the name of Jesus. <laughs> we got the victory. We had a bishop at my mother's funeral. Those who were there saw it. Man got up and I wanted to stand up and say, man, sit your skinny. <laughs> Mixed up self down. Standing up over my mother, talking about. With a whole lot of following. You see, this is why, family, we can lie, cheat, steal, fornicate, commit adultery, be a homosexual, be a lesbian, all kind of crooked activity. We can back bite one another, walk around jealous and envious of one another and don't feel nothing. Because those who are supposed to set the standard, set the example for us have engaged in such activity. What are the people supposed to do? You don't really believe in Jesus? or the Christ. You don't even believe in God's anointed, period. You know, it's more important that you have good standing with the, what do you call it? The, 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 the moderator and the, and the coalition and the, and the minister's union and the clergy alliance and that's more important than God being satisfied with you. But I got, I got news for you. I got news for you. God is allowing this message for a reason because it's about to change here in Dred Scott City. I have to be honest with y'all. When I first came to this city, 
I understood clearly why God sent me here. When you got a when you got a church that's running a cocaine ring out of the church, something's wrong. When you got a, a preacher who's running a prostitution ring out of his church, something's wrong. When you got pastors who meet regularly not to talk about how they can better the spiritual growth of their people but to watch X-rated videos together. Something's wrong. And I dare them to get up and talk about me because I'll call their names out. And you want to know why our people are messed up. That's why I stay to myself in this city. Just why. I don't need that mess in my space. And the only way I'm going to be able to stand and say what I'm saying is if I keep myself separate from that mess. Y'all hear what I'm saying? No praise to me. I'm not saying that for that purpose. I'm saying it because the ministry is too serious. Our brothers and sisters are lost and confused because those who are supposed to be the standard of righteousness have lived and shown our people a double or triple standard. The kind of religion that we are passing on to our children. And don't you think for one moment, y'all, that our children don't see our hypocritical behavior. Don't you think that, I don't care how young they are, they may be in their PlayStation acting like they ain't listening to you, but they hear you on that telephone. The religion that we're passing down to our people has been given to us is really an anti-God religion. Where did this religion come from? We got to go back to those who mandated it in the first place, like a sick, sadistic person called Constantine. Got to go back there. You know, people who believed, y'all just let me go here for a moment so I can help wake you up. Okay? Don't mess with my Jesus now. Ah, you don't know. See, look at the person next to you and say, it was Christians. It was Christians. People who believed in Jesus. Who packed us in the hull of slave ships. Understand that. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that Christians are evil. I'm not saying that. Again, it's back to sincerity of heart. A lot of our people are what they are because that's all they know. Okay? But see, the truth of the matter is you don't know the real story behind its existence. It was people who believed in Jesus. Okay, in fact, in case y'all don't know it, the first slave ship was called Jesus. Okay? The vicar of Christ. Vicar means one who stands in the place of Christ. Ain't but one person on this planet that carries that title. He's called the Pope. I'm not even going to bring up the new one. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that today. But the vicar of Christ stood behind this mistreatment of African people. And the same doctrines and tenets that these people believe in is what we have taught 
to our children. It was taught to me. It was taught to my, my mother, my, my grandmother, my, grandmother, my grandmother's mother, and so forth. And we give our all to this lie that was given to us. I'll say it again, and I'm, I, won't, I try not to say it too much, but being that this is my first time back since my mom's transition, I, I'll say it to you. I'm a little angry. And I'll tell you why I'm a little angry. I'm a little angry because my mother died or made her transition bleeding with everything in her that she was going to be raptured away. Four prophets came to her church and said, Dr. Gilmore, the Lord said, you're going to be caught up. You ain't gonna, you're not gonna, you ain't gonna die a physical death. I mean, she honestly believed that she would not be, we would not have her funeral. She'd be caught away. We had her funeral. How many hundreds of thousands of our loved ones are dying with a false hope? That might not mean nothing to you. But wait until your loved one dies and they're dying believing in something that is false. What are you going to do about that? I tried. And my mom said to me one day, she said, Ray, listen. This is what I believe. Don't take it from me. At 83 years old, I said, yes, ma'am. So I didn't want her to die before she was, you know, I didn't want her to die back then, you know what I'm saying? But it's something when your loved one leaves this planet and then find out that everything they've been preaching and teaching was a lie. Where did this thing come from? To compound the matter, we got this guy named James Stewart, better known as King James, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, who mandated that the Church of England teach from his version of the Bible. Only the aristocrats of Europe were allowed to have this privilege of reading and teaching from the King James version of the Bible. And, and then you really, really were deep, deep about it from, from the late 1400s until 1893. Facts. We, African people, we were prohibited from practicing our African spirituality. That was during the slavery period. Anything that came from Africa, man, you'd be flogged from being an African. Yes, I was watching this movie. I encourage y'all to go get it if you haven't seen it. It's called um, uh, Hotel Rwanda. Yes, Some of y'all evidently watched it. And the heaviest statement in that movie, I, I can't think of the black actor's name, but the heaviest statement in that movie is when he found out, he said, they told me, he's talking about the white man, because he was a house Negro, right? He, he, said, he said, they told me I was one of them. <laughs> How many of y'all saw that? They, meaning the white man, told me that I was one of them. So he lived his life as a privileged Negro until genocide started happening and he found out that the UN sent the troops in to get the white folk out. That's what I mean, y'all, when I say racism. White people will benefit from racism even if they're not a racist. Yes. Simply because they're white. Yes. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. White sympathizers 
who sympathize with black folk, we're giving them money. Da, 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 da. Here, you'll be all right. We're going to see you do whatever you can. But we got to go. Bye. <laughs> because the, it had been dropped down. All right, it's time to get rid of these people now. And hey, when are you going to realize that they told you that you were one of them? <laughs> and lied to you. Am I making sense, y'all? We were prevented from, from, from practicing our African spirituality. And we were forced into Euro-Christianity in the name of Jesus. And it's so deep because they put it in us so heavy, so strong, so powerful, that most of us don't even know how to pray unless we say, in Jesus' name. I mean, I don't know if y'all go through this or not. When in my transition, for a few months, I couldn't pray. All because of that, the ending, in Jesus' name. That's some serious programming. The program that you've been taught that you can't get nothing from God unless you ask for it in Jesus' name. Look at the person nearest you and say, it's time for us to be free. You're taught this program. You're also taught that this program is the answer to all your, some, all your problems. We used to sing a song. Jesus is the answer. Oh, y'all heard that song before? Now don't get me wrong. Again, please understand. I understand the sincerity of our people. But why is it that as strong as we stand upon that and sing that song, we sell drugs to each other? I'm talking about people who grew up singing that song, sell drugs to each other. Why is it that our young people who grew up singing the B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand all alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Why is it that that young man who used to sing that song now has no problem riding down Newstead Avenue with an automatic weapon and shooting his own brother? Why is it that that, that, that that doesn't stop them from doing a drive-by? Yes, yes, yes. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Yes. Why is it that our brothers who grew up learning how to recite the 100th song, mm. young boys in the church make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you man, serve the love of goodness. You know, I mean, you know, and why is it that these young men who, who grew up with these principles can now at an adult stage take their fists, ball it up, and hit their queen in the face with it. Why doesn't that stop them from this behavior? Look at the person that says it because it's powerless. The program that the oppressor gave us is powerless. Now don't say, well, God, that ain't true. That ain't true. It was power for me. Listen, listen, listen. I know people who don't believe in that program at all who don't do drugs. That's called self-discipline. That's what that's called. There's a difference between spiritual power and self-discipline. All right? Yeah, buddy. I contend that many people who say they know Christ. Don't really know Christ at all. How are you going to keep God's commandments when you don't know God's commandments? Because your religion has taught you that the law of God has been done away with. 
Did y'all, did that make sense? Let me run it back by you again. Paul says, who did I just say? Y'all know Paul I'm talking about? I ain't talking about Paul Jackson now. I'm talking about Paul of the Bible, right? The writer of all of these books. Paul says that the law has been done away with. Paul says that a man is justified by faith without the works of the law. Paul? Yeah. So therefore, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. All of these Bible verses are quoting here. So that means you're made right with God, not by doing right, but by believing. Y'all hear what I'm saying? I was invited to a church while I was up in New Jersey, and of course, at the end of the service, the man said, Real, it blew my mind, real tall white man, and the entire congregation was black. You know, see, right off the bat, because of where my head is at, I had a problem with that. You know, I looked at my black people, they didn't have no problem with it, though. You know, I mean, like, because you know why they didn't have no problem with it? Because he looked like their savior. You see what I'm saying? The person who they've been taught to pray to looks just like that tall white man who's getting the altar call now. So it's okay. And they said, who wants to be saved? And about 50 people jumped up out of their seat and ran out of the front. And he said, repeat after me. Lord, I am a sinner. I deserve to go to hell. And da, 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 da. But now, Lord, come into my life and save me. And they repeated after him, and about 45 seconds later, he looked at them, Elder Watkins, and said, Now you're saved. <laughs> I mean, he looked, at, he looked at this one dude. I mean, you could tell this one dude was just, I mean, he like. <laughs> and he looked right at him. He said, Even you, young man. You are on your way to heaven right now. I wanted to jump. Y'all, I'm going to tell you, I was a guest. I was invited. I wanted to jump up and say, y'all, cut this <laughs> out. You know, I mean, like, how dare you? How dare you put that lie into these people's heads and tell them that they are now saved because they repeated after you. I didn't want to go to jail, man. <laughs> it was good for me, though, because it, it refueled my mission to awaken my people from this, 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 this drug of their mind. Mm, 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 mm. In the meantime, through it all, we spend our time making the very person who gave us the lie comfortable and, and secure. We secure him with our money. We make them comfortable because we won't even, you know, y'all not know that there's some black folk who are still in the psychosis of when they, when they pass a white man, they, they, they drop their head a little bit, you know, or automatically step aside when they're coming down the sidewalk. You know, now they're coming down the sidewalk, it's like, okay, the sidewalk ain't that wide, one of us is going to move. Which one's it going to be? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna leave that alone. I don't want, I don't want y'all walking out here getting in no fight with nobody. Okay, I can see y'all now walking down the sidewalk. Pastor Ray said, "Don't move." <laughs> then you'd be calling me, Pastor Ray. I need to get bailed out of jail. <laughs> oh, buddy. 
You've been taught to be a good Christian. That really means take care of your master. Unfortunately, most religious leaders today that are in the business of religion are good house Negroes. Right. During slavery, when black people like me talked to the slave, they didn't kill him. They sent some old house Negro along behind him to undo what he said. You have to read the history of slavery to understand this. There were two kinds of Negroes. There was that old house Negro and the field Negro. And the house Negro always looked out for his master. When the field Negroes got too much out of line, he held them back in check. He put them back on the plantation. The house Negro could afford to do that because he lived better than the field Negro. He ate better, he dressed better, and he lived in a better house. He lived right up next to his master in the attic or the basement. He ate the same food his master ate and wore his same clothes. And he could talk just like his master. master. Good diction. And he loved his master more than his master loved himself. That's why he didn't want his master hurt. If the master got sick, he'd say, what's the matter, boss? We sick. When the master's house caught a fire, he'd try and put the fire out. He didn't want his master's house burned. He never wanted his master's property threatened. And he was more defensive of it than the master was. That was the house Negro. But then you had some field Negroes who lived in huts, had nothing to lose. They wore the worst kind of clothes, they ate the worst food, and they caught hell. They felt the sting of the lash. They hated their master. Oh, yes, they did. If the master got sick, they prayed that the master died. <laughs> If the master's house caught a fire, they prayed for a strong wind to come along. This was the difference between the two. And today you still have house Negroes and field Negroes. The master's welfare. They don't really even care about their own, as long as... I, I, got, to, I got to repeat the brother's words again. We've been misled. I mean, these are immortal words from Brother Malcolm X. We've been had. We've been hoodwinked. Hoodwinked, y'all, means blindfolded. We've been bamboozled. And if we don't correct the error of our ways, our children will become the victims of this agenda and psychological defeat. So brothers and sisters, understand, my job, my assignment, the whole reason why I breathe is to stand here to help our people who are lost be saved. And I don't mean it like I used to mean it. See, years ago when I say, I'm here to see that you get saved. What I meant was I'm here to see that you accept the program of the oppressor. And it was saved me now. Not in my consciousness. Actually, it never did mean what I thought it meant. That's just what they told me it meant. Actually, saved has always meant, always meant to be delivered from the word so so it means to be made safe it means to be protected it means to be strengthened it means to be made to stand tall right. and straight so when you ask a person are they saved you ought to see it in their life <laughs> the African man if he's saved Shouldn't be a punk no more. Right. Y'all hear what I'm saying? If a, if, a, if a black man is saved, you ought to hear the warrior spirit coming from his lungs when he opens his mouth. That's one of the reasons I like uh, with the young, what they're doing here, brothers to brothers and sisters too. I notice when the young people who participate in that program stand up, they stand tall and say, Hotep, I'm so and 
so and so are brothers to brothers and sisters too where we're teaching young men and women to be strong, something to that effect. Yes. And no need for a black man who's saved to be talking and talking like that. Man. <laughs> You see a black man and say he's saved and talk like a smacker. <laughs> Wake him up. Say, brother, you might be on your way to being saved, but you ain't saved yet. Y'all remember the story I told y'all about the tiger who thought he was a goat? A little tiger, a little, a little young tiger who thinking he's a goat from a bad. <laughs> When you're a black man, your woman want to hear you roar. Oh, shucks now. You want your woman to respect you? Roar, brother. Now, I don't mean roar at her. Because, see, the black woman is segment. For those who don't know, that's the woman with the woman, a woman's body with a lion's head in ancient Egypt. Okay, and that woman got a lioness in her. Okay, and if you roar at her, you're gonna get roared back at her. Okay. I'm telling you, them days don't go no more, alright? But when I say your woman wants to hear you roar, black man, that means when something is attacking your environment. When racism is at work destroying your family unit and trying to kill your children, brother, you ought to be in the position to stand up and say, I ain't going to have it. That's what I'm talking about. Ooh, buddy. God has called us. Some of you here, not just me. God has called some of us in here to be Mashiachs. That means that God has anointed you. And trust me when I tell you this. Trust what I'm saying to you. If God appoints you, God will anoint you. You don't have to worry about it. If God puts it in you to do something, don't sit back and feel like you're inadequate. Well, folk ain't going to like me if I say that. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, don't worry about what people say. Listen, listen, listen. The people ain't putting no food on your table. The people ain't putting clothes on your back. It's God that's taking care of you. So you do what God wants you to do. Oh, uh, yeah. I, 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 feel, I feel something getting ready to happen here. And when I say here, I don't just mean here. I mean in this place, in, in Dred Scott City. I, I, brothers and sisters in ministry are starting to hear this message. Be like the man said to me. I'll never forget these words. Old man, right around the corner, I haven't seen him since. He said, young man, God did call you to preach, but he called you to preach the truth. Yeah. Those of you here who God has called to preach, I'm telling you that, God called you to preach the truth, not church doctrine, not human opinion. So be sure you get the truth and proclaim such. And if don't nobody like you, it's all right. It's all right. To me, Religion, my idea of religion is this. I think that if you, I, I got I learned this in jail because I, I talked to every guy there was in jail. I think that if you take one one of the O's out of good, it's God. If you had a D to evil, it's the devil. I think some cool motherfuckers sat down a long time ago and said, let's figure out a way that we can control motherfuckers. And that's what they came up with, is the Bible. Because if the guy wrote the Bible, I'm sure it would have been a revised copy by now. You know what I mean? Because a lot of shit has changed. And I've been looking for this revised copy, and I don't see it. I still see that same old copy that they had from then. And I'm not disrespecting anybody's religion. Please forgive me if it comes off like that. I'm just stating my opinion. I feel like we get crucified. I mean, the Bible was telling us all these people did this because they suffered this much. That's what makes them special people. I got shot five times. One, two, three, 
four, five. You know what I mean? I, I, and I got crucified to the media. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? And I think heaven is just when you sleep, you sleep with a good conscience. You don't have nightmares. And hell is when you sleep, the last thing you see is all the fucked up things you did in your life. And you just see it over and over again. Because you don't burn. Because if, if that's the case, it's hell on earth because bullets burn. You know what I mean? It's people that got burned in fires. That means they went to hell already. You know what I mean? All that is here. So what, what else? What do you got there that we ain't seen here? What, you gonna walk around aimlessly, that zombie? Nigga, that's here. You ain't been on the streets lately. You know what I mean? What, what heaven is now. Look, we sitting up here in the little big screen. It's heaven for the moment. You know what I mean? Hell is jail. I seen that one. Trust me, this is this is what's real. And all that other shit is to control you. If the churches took half the money that they was making and gave it back to the community, we'd be all right. If they take half the buildings that they used to praise God and gave it to motherfuckers who need God, we'd be all right. We be all right. Have you seen some of these goddamn churches lately? It's ones that take up the whole block in New York. It's homeless people out here. Why ain't God letting them stay here? Why these niggas got gold ceilings and shit? Why God need gold ceilings to talk to me?